Hello again, I'm Matthew Gore from lightandmatter.org, and this week, as expected, I'm comparing the Sigma 50mm f1.4 art series lens with the Canon 50mm f1.2L. The Sigma feels wonderful in the hand, but it's heavy, 1.8 pounds and almost 4 inches long. The Canon is shorter and lighter, at 1.3 pounds and only about 2.5 inches long, but it also feels nicely made. Of course, there's a third of a stop difference in maximum aperture, but there's also another difference, about $600. So is the Canon worth $600 more than the Sigma? Let's find out. To start with, let's check out how they sound. For comparison, here's the old Canon 50mm f1.8 that we're all familiar with. It's pretty noisy. Now here's the Sigma. It's just a whisper in comparison. Now finally, here's the Canon 1.2L. It's also nice and quiet, pretty much identical to the Sigma. It does sound slower, though. The same thing shows up when we look at the waveforms. The 1.8 looks very loud, but the Sigma and the Canon look just about the same. But let's move on to what everybody wants to know, the image quality. Before the weather turned bad, I had one nice sunny evening in Seattle with these lenses. I used my standard methodology and shot with the 5D Mark III from a sturdy tripod using live view to focus, and a remote release. I shot raw and processed the files at 16-bit, and didn't apply any sharpening or lens correction in post. If you'd like to take a look at the original raw files, you can download them here from the full review article. Starting off with both lenses wide open, it's immediately obvious that the Sigma is sharper in the center of the frame. In high contrast areas, the Canon displays quite a bit of magenta fringing, especially along the top border of anything that is white in the image. A little further from the center, the same thing is true, but a little more pronounced. And at the edge of the frame, the highlights on the Canon side look very smeary and soft overall. Comparing them at the same aperture, f1.4, not a lot changes. The Canon is a little more contrasty than it was at 1.2, but it still has serious chromatic aberration issues, and it just isn't as sharp as the Sigma here in the center. The same thing is true a little bit away from the center. The Canon is better than it was at 1.2, but it's still soft compared to the Sigma. And out at the edge, the Canon is still a mess. At f2, the Canon gets quite a bit better in the center of the frame. In fact, the difference between the Canon and the Sigma there is pretty negligible. But just a little bit further away from the center, the Sigma is still significantly sharper. Take a look at the details in the crane and around the edges of the Space Needle. Coming out to the edge of the frame, it won't surprise anybody at this point that the Canon is still quite a bit softer than the Sigma. Although, it's not the smudgy mess that it was at 1.4 either. It's starting to pull itself together. If we stop down another full stop to f2.8, both images are beautifully sharp in the center. I'd be hard pressed to tell the difference, although there's a little more contrast in some parts of the Sigma side. However, just a short distance away, the Sigma is still clearly sharper. And if we stop down to f4 here, the Canon still just isn't resolving as much detail. And out here at the edge, while the Canon is starting to look pretty respectable, it's still not as sharp as the Sigma. It's getting close though. Stopping down to f8, the Sigma and the Canon are pretty closely matched now, here away from the center. They both look pretty nice. And out at the edge, I'd say they look about the same too. Now let's take a quick look at one more example, since I showed part of it in the previous video. Starting at f1.4, they're both pretty similar in the center of the frame, although the Sigma is a little bit sharper overall. The same thing is true a little further away from the center of the frame at this aperture. But over here at the edge of the frame, you can see that the Sigma is nice and sharp, while the tree on the Canon side is really blurry. Stopping down to f2, the Sigma looks a little sharper overall in the center, and it resolves the fine details better in the background. And a little ways away from the center here, the stopped down Sigma is now noticeably sharper than the Canon, 
which looks a bit soft. Moving down to the opposite corner from the last time, there's no question that the sigma is giving us better resolution. If we jump to f4, the difference in the center of the image is gone for all practical purposes. But away from the center again, the sigma remains outstandingly sharp while the canon remains pretty blurry. And taking a look at both corners, we can see that the sigma remains much sharper on both sides of the frame. The same thing holds true at a 5.6. The centers are indistinguishable, but away from the center, the sigma is still sharper, and in the corners, the canon is still just a bit blurry, but if we stop down to f8, the canon is probably just about as good as the sigma. If you'd like to see some more examples, you can just click on this link and check them out on the website. In summary though, the Sigma lens provides better sharpness and resolution across the frame wide open, and while the Canon catches up in the center around f2.8, it doesn't catch up in the corners until f8 or so. The Canon suffers from strong chromatic aberration from wide open until about f2, even in the center of the frame. Before we go on to more important matters, there are a couple of minor things that I'd like to mention. First is the field of view of these lenses. You may have already noticed that objects on the Sigma side appear to be just a touch smaller than on the Canon. And if we look at a couple of uncropped images in succession, it's pretty obvious that the Sigma has a wider field of view. I didn't measure the exact focal length of these lenses, but we can get an idea of the difference by measuring the pixel distance from set points on each image. On the Canon, I'm measuring from this building corner up to the tip of this other building, and I get a distance of 5,544 pixels. Now, if we measure from the same points on the Sigma image, the distance is only 5,380 pixels. It's not a big difference, but if you do the math, it's about 3%. That means that if the Canon is a true 50mm lens, which seems likely, then the Sigma is a 48.5mm lens, at least roughly. That difference is insignificant for all practical purposes, but it's worth mentioning. Now let's look at the distortion characteristics of these lenses. Here's the uncorrected Canon, and here's the corrected version. You can see that the original has some barrel distortion that's being flattened out with the lens profile in post. Now here's the uncorrected Sigma image, and here's the corrected. If you were looking closely, you notice that the correction fixed a little bit of pincushion distortion instead of barrel distortion, but it was just a little bit. If those are new terms to you, barrel distortion refers to cases where lines that should be straight bend away from the center of the image. And pincushion distortion is the opposite of that. Straight lines appear to bend towards the center of the image. With both of these 50mm lenses, though, the amount of distortion is very minor and easy to fix. It's nothing to worry about. When it comes to bokeh, there are some significant differences, though. Looking at a couple of images shot wide open with each lens, we'd expect the larger aperture of the f1.2 to give us a smoother background, and that does seem to be the case, especially over in areas like this. Although the Sigma also looks really nice to me, it doesn't look as messy in this area. If we zoom in to 100% and look at the highlights, we see again that the Canon's highlight ball is larger and more diffuse, while the Sigma's is more compact and contrasty. There's a little color fringing too, but not much. With both at f1.4, the results are also more similar, although the Canon's bokeh balls get less round. If we stop both lenses down, two stops to f2.8, so the aperture blades come into play for both lenses, both produce nice results, but the Canon still creates a larger, smoother blur, while the Sigma is a bit more contrasty. And if we zoom in to 100% on some of these highlights, they both look nice and round, although the Sigma is probably just a bit rounder, but also a bit more nervous looking. Here's another example of the Sigma at f1.4, and here's the Canon, also at 1.4. It's a pretty significant difference, as long as there are highlights in the background, but the difference is not so pronounced without them. Here's Boris, shot at 1.4 with both lenses. Not a whole lot of background difference. Mm-hmm.
How about some night shots? With both lenses at f1.4, the Sigma produces rounder, more contrasty bokeh, which is to be expected since its aperture blades are not being used. But even when I open up the Canon to f1.2, the bokeh circles are clipped at the top. And if I zoom in a little bit more, we can clearly see concentric circles, sometimes called onion rings, in the Canon highlights, while the Sigma side remains pretty smooth. Looking at another example with both lenses at f1.4, we see the same general thing. The Canon has clearly visible onion rings, while the Sigma looks pretty smooth. Although, there are some hints of texture in there too. When opened up to f1.2, the Canon has clipped highlight circles here again. And that's not just a fluke, that seems to be typical. That said, at f1.2, the blurred highlights are always larger than they are on the Sigma side. And that brings us to autofocus performance. Let me begin by saying that all large aperture prime lenses can be tricky to focus correctly. It takes practice and occasionally a bit of luck since the depth of field is so shallow. And it's especially difficult at f1.2 since the focus is so shallow that accidentally focusing on a nose can mean that the eyes are too blurry for the image to be usable. That's not because there's anything wrong with the lenses, it's just the nature of shooting with such a shallow depth of field. Even taking that into consideration, I had a lot of trouble focusing consistently with the Canon lens. For reliable results, I generally had to shoot with a single autofocus point, or sometimes a small group. And even then, focus didn't always end up where I expected. To test these lenses, I decided to shoot the Lunar New Year Festival and some street photography with both of them. I ended up shooting with the Sigma a lot more than the Canon, and I didn't like anything that I did shoot with the Canon. In fact, not being very satisfied with what I got at the festival, I shot some more pictures at Pike Place Market and down along the waterfront, and I felt pretty comfortable with the Sigma, but still not so much with the Canon. So the next day, I decided to shoot in Mark Ellinger's glass studio in Stanwood. I thought that the low light would be a good test for these lenses, and it was. I got some nice rim light from the kiln here, although I got some lens flare too, right here. And of course, the shallow depth of field was helpful for focusing attention on the foreground details. Getting the right area in focus was tricky though. I switched to the Sigma for a while and I continued to have pretty good luck with it. Ultimately, I found that the focus accuracy of the Sigma was no worse than the Canon f1.4 from the previous comparison, and the Canon f1.2 was still pretty temperamental but practice helped. With the Canon, I'll probably stick to posed portraits and other static subjects. Now, before wrapping up, let's take a quick look at these lenses' vignetting. The vignetting on these lenses is pretty similar, but just a bit worse on the Canon. Check it out. On the Canon, significant darkening starts to appear at f2.8 in the corners, but not until f2 on the Sigma. And at f1.4, the Canon is about a half stop darker in the corners, and of course, it's even darker when opened up to f1.2. It's not a huge difference, but it's significant enough to mention. So to summarize all of this, the focus noise is a dead tie, but when it comes to the resolution, the Sigma is better in the center and at the edges. Although it's not very significant, the Sigma also has less distortion. The Bokeh is really a matter of taste, but the Canon can still provide more blur and frequently smoother blur. When it comes to autofocus, I'd much rather shoot events with the Sigma. It seemed faster and more reliable, and the Sigma also had a bit less vignetting. It's worth noting that the Sigma is significantly longer and heavier than the Canon, and of course, it's about $600 cheaper. So what this comes down to is this. If you really need the shallowest depth of field possible, the Canon is your best option. But otherwise, I'd probably go with the Sigma. My next video will compare the new Tamron 15-30 f2.8 and the new Canon 16-35mm f4 since they're both stabilized and cost about the same. If you're not already a subscriber to my channel, this is a good time to do it. And finally, I remain optimistic that someone out there will eventually decide to help support this channel. Seriously, it will help me make more and better videos like this. So click on the link above and you can donate through YouTube, if you're in the USA at least. 
or a couple of other countries. And that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'm always interested to hear your ideas for future videos, so let me know in the comments below.